أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين باري الخلائق أجمعين بائث الأنبياء والمرسلين والحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا أجل ممدود فطر الخلائق بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته ووتد بالصخور ميدان أرضه ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد صلي على محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وكل رب يدخلني مدخل صدق وأخرجني مخرج صدق وجعل لي من لدنك سلطانا نسيرا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلي على محمد وآل محمد أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته. I begin in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. It's due to that kindness and mercy that we have these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and glorification of Him, Tabaraka wa Taala. We then begin this sermon the way the Commander of the Faithful used to begin many of his by advising us, Usikum ibadallah bi taqwallah. That I advise you, the servants of God, to be God-conscious, God-fearing, and pious human beings. We are fortunate, alhamdulillah, that we are at the doorstep of the greatest time of the year, the month of Shahru Ramadan, a month which is described for us in very many beautiful, eloquent manners. But one of the ways that we are reminded of the greatness of this month comes in one of the du'as we recite every day, where we say, Wahada shahrun." عَذَّمْتَهُ وَكَرَّمْتَهُ أَحْسَنْتُمْ وَشَرَّفْتَهُ وَفَضَّلْتَهُ عَلَى الشُّهُورِ That this is a month in which you have made exalted, honored, ennobled, and excelled over all other months. And so we are very fortunate that we are at this doorstep and we pray. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us enough life to see this month insha'Allah. And that in it our fasts are accepted, our du'as are answered, and that we leave the month of Ramadan as better servants than we entered it, insha'Allah. Out of the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, the month of Shahru Ramadan has many different benefits and many different glories attached to it. But one of the things that is always mindful that we should appreciate is that the month of Ramadan comes bearing gifts, you know. Um, unlike something that is honored and you receive it after working hard for it, you know, that you receive it. Like, I don't get my paycheck before I do my job, you know, nor do I get a degree before I go to school. But this month, you don't have to fast to get the gifts of God. You just being alive in that moment, the month comes with gifts. You know, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, Salli ala Muhammad. The salawat sound like you guys are fasting already. Can we recite a loud salawat, please? <laughs> Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The Prophet in the sermon that he recited on the last Jum'ah of Sha'ban, which is a day like today, he's reported to have said, Ayyuhannas, 
انه قد اقبل اليكم شهر الله بالبركه والرحمه والمغفره that all mankind the month of ramadan has approached you and it comes with barakah it comes with blessings it comes with rahma mercy and it comes with maghfira shahru huwa inda allah afdal ash-shuhur wa ayyamuhu afdal al-ayam wa layalihi afdal al-layali wa sa'atuhu afdal sa'at everything about this month not only does it come bearing gifts not only does it come bearing barakats blessings of allah azza wa jal and rahma and maghfira but every moment of this month is filled with blessings it is months that are better than any other months um that are there besides that when you look at some of the benefits that are associated with this month you know we also find that in this month those who participate in it are the guests of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa huwa shahrun du'itum fihi ila diyafatillah it is a month in which you are welcome to the banquet of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know when you look at the concept of diyafa of being invited by god there are two types of diyafa there is diyafatul amma and there is diyafatul khassa diyafatul amma is a general banquet that all of us whether or not we believe or not we are guests of god and we benefit from the host of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but then there are special times when we become the special guests of god yeah um when you go for hajj you are the special guest of god the month of ramadan is one of those opportunities where we become the special guest of allah and therefore god is available in this month our ability to connect to him in this month is there it depends on how much work we put in and other benefits like maghfira are available for us there are two things that we have to understand the first is that this offer is available to everyone yeah that means you don't have to do something special to get god's attention in this month you don't have to do something special to get rahma in this month you don't have to do some you just have to be alive right and so this is something that this is why in the first thing we said is we thank allah azza wa jal and we ask him to give us enough life to see this month man just to smell the fragrance of that month would be enough to satisfy the soul yeah and so it's really important that we ask for this that we know life is not for granted no no everyone knows this and if we don't we should remind ourselves that we can't take life for granted and so i make dua that i get to see this month because it's a very important time of the year the second point is that even though this offer is available to everyone the way we maximize this offer and the way we get more of this is by exerting more towards allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore these gifts of god are endless there is no limit but the capacity in how much we receive is dependent on how much work we put forward how much effort we put forward and so the people who will benefit the most in this month are those who actually intentionally strive towards getting closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is where we have to then look at our responsibility you know the the principle in islam is very clear and that is that when someone does something good for you it is our responsibility to return back with goodness allah azza wa jal says in the quran hal jazaa ul ihsan ihsan we know this verse huh is the reward or the benefit is the reward of good anything other than doing good back yeah and so when this month comes with blessings it's our responsibility to shower our goodness and effort into this month as well and there are a few things that i want us to concentrate on in this month that will show that we are willing and intentionally striving and deserving of anything extra that is available in this month that is reserved for those who put in effort the first thing that we have to do is that we have to fast with passion and zeal yeah we have to come into this month with excitement right not you know when you were kids you're like ah ramadan's here already right um some of us think of that the same when we get older you know <laughs> but we have to be excited about this month it's not just about fasting right this is why we have traditions that say that if you understood what is ramadan you would wish it lasted the whole year right 
It's not about the hunger and the thirst. And there will be hunger and thirst inevitably, right? But it's more than that. It's something where if, I, if we were told that doing sp something very specific will get us something very specific that we really wanted, and even if that effort was difficult, but if the reward was that great, we would be willing to sacrifice to reach that reward, isn't it? Of course. The small things, you know, like every time I go for ziyarat now, I, I think I'm getting old to sit on these 20 hour flights, you know, it's tiring. But then when you get there, you forget the difficulty of that journey, yeah? Very similar to this, right? That if we understood in the spiritual realm what we benefited from, you know, in the physical realm we might lose a couple of pounds, you know, but in the spiritual realm we could attain such statuses that the effort would be, would be worth it. Yeah, and so come into this month with that excitement. Is this something you got to pump yourself up with? You have to talk to yourself. But be excited about what's available in this month and concentrate as well on that physical fast. Obviously, not just hunger and thirst, but there is a spiritual fasting that we have to do. Say the Zahra alayha afdalu salatu wa salam. Min wa ali Muhammad. She's reported to have said, Ma yasna usaim. مَا يَسْنَعُ السَّائِمْ بِسِيَامِهِ إِذَا لَمْ يَسْنْ لِسَانَهُ وَسَمْعُهُ وَبَصَرَهُ وَجِوَارِهُ He said that what does a fasting person benefit from fasting when they don't control their sight and their hearings and their tongues and their actions, right? And so we have to raise it to that next level, you know. Um, we just have to be more controlled human beings in the month of Ramadan. You know, in the month of Ramadan, We'll fight with people for no reason, you know. Sensitivities are heightened for no reason, you know. Um, all because we're hungry, that's the only reason. Well, everyone's hungry, right? And the reason other people don't act up, maybe they have more control than we do. And so we have to just have more control in the month of Ramadan, right? Just being hungry is not an excuse for me to act in a manner that is not with good akhlaq, okay? Um, and if having good akhlaq is difficult for me while I'm hungry, it's probably because I'm not used to being hungry. And so maybe I should be hungry more often during the year. I'm so satiated all the time that I don't know how it feels and how I respond when I'm hungry, right? And so be kinder to each other. Be more intentional. Think things through, right? Um, it's always interesting, right? Like, I know the things that people do that annoy me. I know it. Yeah, I'm not going to look at anybody in particular, you know. But I know that this guy's going to say this to me today. It normally annoys me. And then, subhanAllah, that guy says something to me today and I get annoyed. What does that say about me? I knew it. I knew it was going to happen and I still responded in the same way. The problem is me, not that person. Yeah, I should be able to control these things. And so while I'm fasting, I should know the things that will annoy me. And so work on that. The second thing I think we should really focus on in this month, and this is something I'm advising myself and then you, Shahru Ramadan is a month in which the atmosphere in a community becomes very beautiful. There are a lot of activities that are held, there are a lot of programs that are held, and I'm not knocking any of them. The month of Ramadan is the month of ibadat. Yeah? And I think we forget that. It's the month of worship, right? We forget that. In the month of Ramadan, we want to have sports leagues. Yeah? In the month of Ramadan, we want to have different sessions of gaming. Fine, okay? Do them. Don't forget the ibadat. We have 11 months to have sports leagues. Yeah? We have 11 months to do late night programs. We have, but we don't. We wake up in the month of Ramadan for some reason. Yeah? Um, and that's something that a culture that I would love to change within the community. I would love to change that. Yeah? Um, this is the month of ibadat. Yeah? No, no hadith tells us, come and play games on this month. Have a sports league in this month. No, no hadith. But hadith tell us, worship God in this month. Yeah? Hadith tell us that looking at the Quran is ibadat. Reading the Qur'an is ibadat. Reciting the Qur'an is ibadat. All of this is ibadat. 
I know we can't spend the whole day reciting Quran. I understand that. And so I'm not saying eliminate these other things. But what I'm saying is don't forget about the ibadat. Yeah? I think this is where we have to just remind ourselves of what the purpose of this is. And the last thing I would say is to, to be prepared for this month. Um, so the first one is come with excitement. Yeah? The second is make sure we have time for ibadat in this month and that we focus on that ibadat and we don't leave the ibadat just on the nights of Qadr, right? And then stress is put upon me that Mulana, the amal went too long. Otherwise, once a year, yeah? And you're complaining about amal going too long, right? Um, but this is the reality of our existence, right? Amal seems difficult. A three-hour movie, no problem. We'll watch it, right? But this is where once a year we have to dedicate ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last thing that I would say to, to maximize this month is avoid every act of disobedience. Yeah? Listen, none of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. We all have habits that we wish we didn't have. Inshallah we will break them one time or another soon. But in the month of Ramadan, do not disobey Allah Azza wa Jal. Do not. Afdalu yeah? al-amal, um, the Prophet said, Fi hadha shahr al-wara'u an maharim illahi Azza wa The best action you can do is to not do anything haram in this month. The best action. And so, if you have to sleep all day, sleep all day. Yeah? Just don't sin in this month. Because that is one of the... the the worst actions that we can do in acts of disobedience to Allah. If we can focus on these three things, inshallah, the doors of mercy will be open for us and we will have no, we will maximize the opportunities that are available to us. إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صدق الله العلي العظيم لعلا <تصفيق> <تصفيق>
start this second sermon remembering those of our brothers and sisters throughout the world who are going through hardships and difficulties, especially our brothers and sisters in Palestine. As the month of Ramadan approaches yet, there is no talk of ceasing the war that is currently going. And so we pray for their strength. We pray for their iman and their well-being. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal <coughs> to bring an end to these difficulties for them, inshallah. I want to wrap up what we were talking about for the past few weeks as well, where we were discussing the family structure in Islam. Um, like I said, we've just touched upon this. It's been four or five weeks, but this, this discussion, uh, a lot more can be said on it. And, and a lot of work has to be put in. There is no manual for it. We just provide guidance and then the work has to be put in by every single person within the family. Um, and like we've said that the moment one person decides not to pull their weight for any act of selfishness, there will be chaos within the family. And that reverberations will be felt by all and what you will find is that relations will begin to break, whether they are sibling relations or parent and child relations or any other variation that are there. Last time we had talked about the, the responsibility of arguing well. Right? We said arguments will happen, but what is important is that we learned how to argue with one another, remembering that you're not my enemy when I argue with you. Rather, there is a base of love that is there, but we respect each other and that we are trying to not dominate you, but just to make you understand where I'm coming from. And then we come to a conclusion, but we talked about that. The last point that I want to talk about today, and this is something that I talked about in the first week, and that is how to deal with extended families. Yeah? Um, in my humble opinion, that one of the main reasons, I don't say the, the most important reason, but one of the main reasons of chaos within the family is because of extended family relations. Yeah? And how the in-laws and the people of the, and the couple who get married, the relationship that exists between them um, and the chaos that is there. You know, family relations, first we have to understand, carry a very important weight in Islam. One of the qualities of being a believer is that they will maintain the relations with their family. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَالَّذِينَ يَسِلُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ and Yusal, that those who believe are those who join and maintain the relationships with those whom God has commanded you to maintain relations with. And so the relationship of, of a child to their parent does not end when that child gets married. But what they also have to understand is that this command of Silatul Raham does not apply to the new member of that family. And so, for example, if a person gets married to a girl, the guy's responsibility is to do silatul raham to his parents. The girl's responsibility is to do silatul raham to her parents. And the acts of obedience that Allah talks about when it comes to parents apply in that way. But the bride has to respect the in-laws. But there is no obedience that is there. Yeah, there is no command of Silatul Raham because they are technically not her parents. You understand? And this is something that we get confused quite often when it comes to these type of relationships. There are a few points that I want to talk about. These are things that have been... Um, I've been waiting for this day for a minute now. Yeah, And so I want to talk about some of these points and I hope that it resonates and it transfers the way it should with a, bu with a clean intention. Yeah that this is important. The first responsibility after people get married is to make sure that they maintain close relations with their parents. And so the first thing that we have to do is that we have to ensure that once we get married, we don't forget about our parents, right? That responsibility of Silatul Raham is there. And so we have to make sure that in the journey of trying to create our own new life, that we do not abandon the relations and the responsibilities that we have towards our parents. At the same time, the parents have to understand that the same attention that I had from my child before marriage is not possible now. 
And so they cannot put this burden or guilt that you don't call me as often. They have a different life now. And so there has to be this communication and this understanding and this middle ground. It's not going to be the same ever again. It doesn't have to be bad, yeah, but it's not the way it was. Before I would see my child every single day. Now my child maybe calls me once or twice a week and I see them on the weekend. This is life. Yeah? You can't expect things to be the same and then this child also. That's just going to add a lot of drama in that relationship. Right? And so the first thing is maintain the relations, but the parents also have to be a little bit flexible and understand that relations are going to be different. The second point is both spouses <coughs> should equally respect each other's families equally. Yeah? And so just because a guy culturally has this, this false superiority that cultures sometimes provide, they think that my families need to be maintained more. No, both families have to be treated equally. And so what that means is that I allocate appropriate time for both sets of families, right? That if we go here for a few hours, I go here for a few hours so that one does not feel like I am abandoning them. Obviously, there are different needs that sometimes families have. And so, for example, if, if my parent is a widow, yeah, and she has more needs, for example, the family needs to understand that. And so you have to look at situations as well. But as far as the respect goes, you can't, as a, as a man, tell your wife that you can only talk to your mom once a week. Who are you to tell her that? Like, honestly, who are you to tell her that, right? Um, this notion that I have wali and I am the wali, man, that's fake intoxication. Yeah, and we have to be very mindful of that. All that wilaya means is that you have more responsibility in the eyes of God. Not that you can be an oppressor. Yeah? And so we have to understand this, that you cannot dictate to your wife. And obviously there has to be an understanding that if I, for example, in my relations with my family, um, am not fulfilling the needs of my spouse, that's different. Figure that out. But that goes back to the first point of understanding the importance of maintaining relations and the way we will maintain. These are conversations that we have to have with our spouses very openly and the dialogue has to have be had. The third is that if we are living together with our in-laws, it is important to address likes and dislikes ahead of time. You know, I can't tell you the number of times yeah, I've had parents come up to me and say, look, my child is getting married. Can you please talk to them and talk about respect of the in-laws? and how they need to be part of the family and like, you know, like understand how we do things. And I stopped them right there. I said, oh, what are you talking about? You're getting a brand new person into your home. Yeah. You know how hard it is to pack up your home as an adult and move to someone else's home. Yeah. Many men don't have to do that. Some do. But my God, that's difficult. I can't imagine that. Right. And so you have a family unit and now you're adding another member to that family unit, and you want that member to change everything about themselves to meet your needs? It doesn't work like that. Everybody needs to change. A new conversation needs to be had to say, okay, hi, this is how we do things. How do you do things? Where can we reach a medium of how we do things? But just because I have always done something a certain way doesn't mean that I expect a grown adult to change their lives to do it the way I I want it done. Yeah? We have it wrong in our heads. Yeah? We have it misunderstood in our heads. And so this is point is really important that there needs to be this dialogue ahead of time so that we can make sure that we are not going to have tension later inside the marriage. The fourth point, if you are living together with your in-laws, it is important to respect the feelings of your spouse in front of other family members. Yeah? And so what that means is that the husband, and this is just an example, but this could be the wife as well, should never side with his mother against his wife. Never. Yeah, I'm telling you. It's a no-win situation. Yeah? And never 
Should the wife try to put the husband between her and the mom? Never. Yeah? Figure it out. Yeah? As a man, it is very difficult when you have to juggle the rights of your mom and the rights of your wife. As a woman, it is very difficult to juggle the rights of your husband and the rights of your parents. You cannot be that thorn in their side to say, pick a side. No, you cannot do that. You know how hard that is, right? And so the responsibility is that you never yeah, make them pick a side. If there is conflict between the child and the parent, they need to talk that out. Yeah? You don't pick a side, ever. You don't ever pick that. And no one should make you pick a side, right? Don't put yourselves in uncomfortable positions because there is no win. There is resentment that is created. There is anger that is going to be fueled. And so you don't make anyone pick sides. And the next point that comes from that is never complain about your spouse to your parents. Never. Yeah? And the second responsibility is that parents should never ask about what's happening in the house. Never. Yeah? That means you don't say, oh, I see you guys are fighting. What are you fighting about? No, don't ask that question, right? And the, and, the, and the spouse should never call their mom or dad and say, oh, can you believe they did? No, never, yeah? You solve your problems yourselves, yourselves. You don't get other people involved in this. Because now imagine your wife has to see your in-law, and then they know that what they... You're asking for drama, Yeah? Grow up. We all need to grow up when it comes to these type of relationships. <coughs> and so never complain. And the last thing is be patient when it comes to arguments. Okay? So just because all of these things are followed doesn't mean there's not going to be arguments. Of course there's going to be arguments. We said arguments will happen always. Um, conflict will arise always. Be patient. My advice to every single person yeah, is that you should never be the one who God is displeased with. Do you understand? So if someone insults me, I can insult them back, and now God is displeased with both of us. Or I can just take that, yeah, and not respond in a manner where now God looks at me with displeasure as well. Okay, And so always be mindful of that, that you never want to be the one um, who God is angry with. And the last point and the seventh point is that as parents, you have to let your children live their own lives. Don't interfere. Please don't interfere. Yeah? Where they live, how much they spend, where they're going on vacation, where they're going to eat. Where... Stay out of it. You had your time to raise them. Yeah, give advice when they ask you to give advice. Otherwise, pray for them, make dua for them, and wish them the best. And do not be a thorn on their side where it makes it difficult for them to practice their marriage well. Marriage in itself is not easy. Yeah, it is absolutely not easy, but it adds a whole new level of complication when the parents don't act like adults. Yeah? And the parents treat and, 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 and conduct themselves as a thorn on the side. We all have this responsibility. These are seven points. I don't want to retell them again. Go back and capture them. But I hope we understand the importance of this, inshallah. And we pray to Allah Azza wa Jal as we approach this great month of barakah and blessings that He brings sukoon into our homes so that it is a house that is filled with light, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صدق الله العلي العظيم